Ahoy there! Captain Benzie here, coming at you with another episode of the Cat Skull Academy, the series that aims to teach you everything you'll need to know about the various different gameplay systems and mechanics in EVE Echoes. In today's lesson we're going to be talking about Armor Guardians and Armor Link modules, so by the end of this video you should have a firm understanding of what both of those are and how they work and operate. You should also know the key differences between Armor Link modules and Shield Field modules, and I've done a video on Shield Field modules elsewhere in the Catskull Academy that you can take a look at if you want to have more information on those. You should also have a good understanding of how skills and ship hulls can affect Armor Link modules. Now if you do enjoy this video, please do let me know by commenting down below and hitting like on the video. Subscribe to the channel for all things Eve Echoes, making sure that you've dinged that notification bell and selected all notifications so that you never miss an upload. If you are finding the Catskull Academy lessons useful as well, please make sure to check out the Catskull Academy playlist on my YouTube channel as it's full of different lectures and lessons like this, designed to help you get the most out of Eve Echoes. Finally, if you do fancy going the extra mile to help support this channel and my content, you can do so both by finding me on Patreon and pledging to support there, where you can learn more about my life in Africa and start earning towards some exclusive merchandise, and we have a dedicated merchandise store on Redbubble as well if you've ever fancied representing the Catskull Academy on something like a t-shirt or a notebook. Anyway, with all of that said and done and out of the way then, let's talk about Armor Link modules and Armor Guardian ships. Before we get started, an important note of warning. If you want to fit an Armor Link module to a ship, you need to ensure that that ship is capable of doing so. Armor Link modules are fairly unique in that they cannot be fitted to just any old ship. You'll need to head into that ship's info page, either via the fitting screen here, or by heading through the ship tree, and look at its roll bonuses. If it has the roll bonus that explicitly states, can fit Armor Link modules, like you see here on the Malatu Guardian, then yes, Yes, it can fit Armor Link modules. If it does not have that roll bonus, then so sorry, you are not able to fit an Armor Link module. Please be aware of that before we proceed further. Armor Link modules are a fairly unique type of mid-slot module that is designed to assist your fleet by helping to mitigate some of the damage that they would take otherwise. Now, unlike shield field modules, Armor Links do not directly benefit the ship that is equipped with them, a key difference. Now, on that note as well, this video will make reference to shield field modules fairly frequently. If you're just here to learn about Armor Link modules, don't worry about that. This video is designed so that everything you need to know is included right here. But if you are looking to understand the key differences between shield field modules and armor link modules, then it may be worth pausing this video now, checking out the shield field module video, and then coming back, just because I will continue to make reference to shield field modules. If you don't care about them, then just ignore those references. Anyway, here we have an Imperial Navy medium armor link module. I've opened up its basic info page so we can look at its stats, discuss what they all mean, and talk about how this actually operates. So first of all, starting at the top here, we have a simultaneous activation here of one. This means that even if you have multiple armor link modules of varying different sizes fitted to your ship, only one of them can be active at any one time. As we go further down, we have a power grid requirement of 94 megawatts. This, combined with the fact that it is a medium armor link module, suggests that this should be fitted to uh, cruisers and to battle cruisers, whereas obviously a small armor link module will have a lower power grid requirement and is designed for use on destroyers, whereas a large armor link module would be designed for larger ships like battleships. Anyway, we then have an activation time of 20 seconds, and right at the bottom we have a fuel consumption of 400 gigajoules. Now, if you're not familiar with fuel, we will be talking about it more later toward the end of this video. Check the timestamps for a link to that. But for now, just understand that every time this cycles, every time it has an activation, it will consume 400 gigajoules worth of fuel from your ship's cargo hold. And if you have insufficient fuel, then the armor link module will not activate, and because it's got an activation time of 20 seconds, it will do that every 20 seconds. When you activate it, it will consume 400 gigajoules, 20 seconds later it will consume another 400 gigajoules, and so on so forth until either you turn it off or you run out of fuel. 
We then have a reactivation delay of 10 seconds. This means if you choose to turn off the armor link module, you must wait for a duration of 10 seconds before you can activate it again. This means that you need to be very careful about when you turn these on or off. If you turn it off and suddenly your fleet starts taking damage, you may have to wait a few seconds before you can start operating it again. We then have an optimal range of 15.72 kilometers. That means that this armor link module is effective up to 15.72 kilometers. If you are at 15.73 kilometers, this armor link module will have no effect on you whatsoever. There is no difference between 15.72 and one kilometer. However, if you are in range, you are in range. It is as simple as that. So what actually happens when you're within range? Well, we have an armor damage transfer when activated of negative 61%. This is where an armor link module really comes into its own, it's exactly what it does. Basically, if a friendly ship is going to take damage onto its armor, 61% of that damage is transferred through to the ship that has the armor link module active. So if a ship was going to take 100 damage onto its armor, 61% of that, which in this example would be 61 damage, is then moved from that ship onto the ship with the armor link module fitted, then it will apply that damage there. You'll notice that there is a final little stat here that says only available within squad 1. This means you cannot have multiple ships with an armor link module active in the same squad in the same fleet and it will only affect friendly ships if they are in the same squad as you are. This means a fleet that has multiple squads will need to have multiple guardians in order to apply that benefit to each of the various different ships. Now essentially what makes this so powerful is that both the resistances of the targeted ship and of the armor guardian take effect. So again, if we were to use the example of 100 damage being taken by a ship that has, for example, 50% resistance, then the 100 damage, 50 of it will be absorbed, 50%, which is 50, will be absorbed. Of that then 50, 61% will be transferred through to the Armor Guardian, which is around about 40 odd percent. Then the Armor Guardian will reduce that based on the amount of armor resistance that itself has and take the final amount of damage. This is absolutely insane and it means that you can absorb an awful lot of damage. Your friends are going to be taking considerably less damage on their armor than they would normally and you take a lot less damage than they would. That original 100 damage shot has applied maybe 10 damage to you at the very end of it so it really does help mitigate an awful lot of the damage that your fleet would otherwise be taking. Please do note that it is only damage that would be taken onto armor. If your friendly ships are only taking damage onto their shields, none of it will be transferred through to you. Also, the difference between the shield field module and the armor link module is that whereas the shield field module gives its own ship a passive increase to its resistances, the armor link module does not apply any form of resistance benefit to the ship that has it active. You will need other modules to help increase your resistances and we'll talk about that more later on when we look at a fitting example. The difference here though between a shield field module and an armor link as well is it doesn't matter where the enemy ships are. With a shield field module, if the enemy ship is within the bubble, then no damage is mitigated. It is only fire that crosses the bubble. Enemy ships outside the bubble firing on friendly ships inside the bubble. There is no bubble with an armor link module, which means if the ship is hit, regardless of the distance between that ship and the enemy shooting at it, the damage will be transferred as long as you are within range of the ship getting hit. Basically, if I'm sitting here parked in a ship that has this armor link module active and 10 kilometers away, a friend of mine is taking damage onto its armor, even it doesn't matter whether the ship shooting at my friend is one kilometer away from him or 50 kilometers away from him, that damage will be transferred to me because I am within the armor link optimal range. We've mentioned that only certain ships can actually fit armor link modules and it requires them to have that roll bonus of can fit armor link modules and you'll find these in two of the main factions, both the Amar Empire and the Galente Federation and due to symmetry in the ship trees we're going to look mainly at the Amar Empire but understand that the equivalent ship will exist in the Galente Federation ship tree as well. None of these are technically unique to either side. I'll explain that more as we go. Let's have a look at the Amar Empire ship tree for an example. 
Now, if we come down to tech level five here on the Destroyer branch, we have our very first Guardian, which is right here, the Coercer Guardian. This is a Destroyer sized guardian ship and being an Amar guardian you would expect it to be an armor tank and if we look at its trait descriptions absolutely there under the roll bonus can fit armor link modules and you'll see that these guardian ships tend to have things like we can see armor resistance plus four percent per level of destroyer defense upgrade there at the top and um, you'll get things like armor resistance or armor repair boosts and things like that on the guardians they are designed to take that damage and have it massively reduced and to mitigate it so a Coercer Guardian is probably one of the first options you will see for actually having a Guardian ship and getting to try out Armor Link modules. Now obviously due to the fact that the Coercer Guardian here only has a power grid of 72 megawatts, you're probably not going to be fitting a medium Armor Link, this would be a small Armor Link module. And as I mentioned, there is an equivalent in the Galente Federation, just to showcase what I mean if we come down to tech level 5 here, um, hopefully I get the right one, nope. There we go. Nope, still the wrong one. There we are. Third time's the charm. Catalyst Guardian. In the Galente ship tree, the Coercer's equivalent is the Catalyst. Therefore, the Coercer Guardian is mirrored in the Catalyst Guardian, which again has the ability to fit armor link modules. And rather than additional armor resistance of 4% per level, here the Catalyst Guardian gets 5% armor, total hit points basically, of 5% increase per level of destroyer defense upgrade. Anyway, let's jump back to the Amar ship tree. That's pretty much it for the small ships. If you're looking for something that uses a small armor link module, it's going to be a Catalyst or a Coercer Guardian. Once we come up to cruiser level, however, we start to get the Mala line for the Amar Empire, and for the Galente, this is the Thorax line. And again, we will look up at tech level 6 here for the Mala Guardian. Now, you've seen already that I'm flying a Mala 2 Guardian, so you can kind of see where this is going. But again, with Guardian in the name, we have that ability, can fit armor link modules. The Amar bonus tends to be the plus 4% armor resistance, whereas the Galente version of the Thorax, we would expect a 5% increase to total armor EHP. Once we've gone from tech level 6 to tech level 7, we then get the Mala 2 Guardian. There we are, sorry, tech level 8, we get the Mala 2 Guardian. It's tech level 6 for the Mala, tech level 7 for the Mala Guardian, tech level 8 for the Mala 2 Guardian. This is the one you've seen in the thumbnail and in the intro to the video here. Again, can fit armor link modules. We get the armor resistance. We've got bigger armor tank as we upgrade from the Mala Guardian to the Mala 2 Guardian. We then lose out on this for a little bit of time. Once we come all the way up to the top, it's not another Mala Guardian. There's no Guardian here up at tech level 10 on the cruiser branch. At tech level 10, the Guardians swap over to the Battle Cruisers, which for the Amar here is the Harbinger Guardian. For the Galente, this will be the Brutix Guardian. It's their main turret version of the Battle Cruiser. Um, and again, being a Guardian ship, you can see we have the roll bonus if I scroll down can fit armor link modules can also fit command bursts which is pretty sweet and has its uses if you fit in an armor command link burst for example but that's a completely separate cat skull academy that we have covered elsewhere again being a mar plus four percent armor resistance as you would expect so that gives us an idea of where those guardians are and again these will be mirrored in the galente federation tree as well whereas the kaldari and the minmatar their guardians are using shield field modules now, I'm often asked if the uh, if the Sanchez Nation ships have shield field modules as one of their role bonuses, is there a particular faction that uses armor link modules, one of the Guardian factions? And the answer is simply put, no. The only two armor factions here are um, the Serpentis Corporation and the Blood Raider Covenant, neither of which currently have any ship that uses armor link modules. It is just found within the Amar Empire and the Galente Federation on the Coercer, on the Mala and on the Harbinger lines. Keep an eye out for those. Those are where you will find your armor guardians. In Eve Echoes, most things can have their effectiveness increased by training into relevant skills. And that's not technically true for armor link modules. Like shield field modules, there is no skill that directly manipulates them. There's no skill that increases their range or ups the amount of the percentage of damage transfer or anything like that. However, when we were looking at the ship hulls, you may have noticed that a particular branch of skills usually has a direct impact on the guardian ships. We are, of course, talking about defense upgrade. So if we come here into maintenance technology, we can have a look at the defense upgrade skill sets. 
Now this, of course, is going to depend on what type of Guardian you're intending to fly. If you want to look at a Coercer or Catalyst Guardian, a Destroyer level, then of course you're going to want to be training into Destroyer Defense Upgrade, which flat out increases your shield, armor, and structure. Um, at set values on the lower levels and then percentages once we hit advanced and expert that of course just gives you more health to work with you're going to be taking a bit more damage on behalf of your friends having a bigger pool of health is going to help also all of the coercer and catalyst guardians are directly affected by destroyer defense upgrade they are benefits to those particular hulls the same is true for the mala guardian the mala 2 guardian the korak uh, the thorax guardian and the thorax 2 guardian they get bonuses from a cruiser defense upgrade and advanced cruiser defense upgrade. This again increases your shield armor and structure by a set amount on your uh, defense upgrade basic. Once you hit advanced it becomes 25% and expert would give you an additional 12.5% well worth training into. Finally, the Harbinger Guardian and indeed the Brutix Guardian both use Battle Cruiser Defense Upgrade which does the same thing. Additional EHP, flat number at basic, percentage 25 at advanced and a 12.5% increase um, for expert level as well. So those are well worth training into. Beyond this, of course, it's worth just talking about the armor operation skills and armor hardening skills. These, if you're going to be taking damage on behalf of other people, you want to be able to have ways to repair that surely. The armor hardening skill is absolutely going to be the most vital because if you're running an armor link module, you are going to be running adaptive armor hardeners and reactive armor hardeners. And we've talked about those elsewhere in separate Cat Skull Academies as well. Basically, by training into armor hardening, you are going to reduce the amount of capacitor actually required to keep those operating, both by increasing the activation time so that you pay the cost less frequently and reducing that actual cost itself. Same once we hit advanced armor hardening, additional activation time and a reduction to capacitor and expert armor hardening, same thing. You're just increasing the time you have between making payments whilst reducing the actual payment that you need to make. Training into armor operation, of course, also has its benefits. If you're going to use an armor repairer yourself in order to actually repair the damage you're taking, then having skills in armor operation is going to be useful because, again, this allows those armor uh, armor repairers to cycle faster and to consume less capacitor in the process. And you'll see that that scales between basic armor operation, advanced operation, and indeed expert armor operation. It's fairly logical, I like to think, that if you are going to be an armor guardian, you're going to want to have defense upgrade for the particular ship type that you are flying, and then you're going to want armor operation and armor hardening up as high as you can get them. Same for shield field modules, you'd swap armor obviously for shield, but we're not talking about that here. Beyond this, those are the main stats that you're going to want to use, plus whatever else is going to benefit the particular ship that you're flying. So again, Cruiser Command is often used on the, uh, the Mala Guardians and the Thorax Guardians um, and things like that. And if you're going to be using a particular type of ship, you're not expecting to do much damage as a Guardian, but you may want to obviously put certain uh, skills into those particular um, weapon systems that that uh, ship would otherwise use. Of course, the fun fact thing with Guardians is because you're not really intending to do much damage, you can quite easily go off meta when it comes to the weapons. I've seen plenty of people running Cruiser Guardians, uh, like a Mala Guardian that's using missiles rather than lasers. I've seen Thorax Guardians using missiles rather than uh, railguns, that kind of thing. I've even seen decomposers being used. Yes, really. Anyway, entirely up to you how you choose to do that, just worth paying mind to. Let's actually have a look at an example of one of these fit for purpose then. Now, I'm going to be demonstrating this using the Mala 2 Guardian, but the theory will carry across to the Mala Guardian, the Coercer Guardian, the Harbinger Guardian, and all of the Galente equivalents as well. Now, we're going to start off here by looking at the high slots. Now, high slots here, I've just gone for medium pulse lasers. Pulse lasers because, heck, unlike shield field modules, armor link allows us to actually get up close to the enemy. It doesn't matter if the enemy is within a certain range of us like it does with shield field, so we may as well benefit from that and make sure that we can use as much DPS as possible. That said, though, in a Guardian vessel, your DPS is not really a priority. Your survival is going to be much more important, so don't stress it too much. This is why I say if you want to fit things like missiles on here, you can do. Yes, okay, the Malatu Guardian does get bonuses to medium laser tracking speed, to damage and capacitor need reduction, but again, your damage isn't exactly vital. It's just an additional thing to the fleet on top of your role of providing tanking. 
Now, this of course then means our mid slot. The first one is going to be, you guessed it, that Imperial Navy Medium Armor Link module. Not much point really undocking a Guardian without the Armor Link module fitted. This is the entire purpose of this ship. Um, and you can see here with the bonuses active, it's, you know, it's all there. It's pretty good. It's going to do what it needs to do. We then have an Energy Nosferatu. I've gone for a medium one here. Can't quite fit a large into this power grid, unfortunately. Um, just to help us keep all of the adaptive armor hardeners and reactive armor hardeners, well, active. Um, keeping those switched on, having enough uh, capacitor there ready for us to activate armor repairers as we require. Activate the micro warp drive in order to, you know, move backward and forward. Again, if we're going to be right up in our opponent's face because we can with an armor link, um, we may as well use the pulse lasers and have an energy Nosferatu in order to do it. If you are going for PvP, I have heard of people putting on neutralizers here, things like large neutralizers, just to help flatten any enemy uh, like frigates and things like that that happen to get close, interceptors, that kind of thing. Again, I personally feel that this is a waste of your capacitor and it could jeopardize your tanking capabilities. Let other people focus on the combat, you need to focus on the survival. So on this front then, we have three adaptive armor hardeners. Now, adaptive armor hardeners, essentially they take up one megawatt of power grid, which is absolutely tiny. There's no difference between a small, a medium, and a large. There are no small, medium, and large adaptive armor hardeners. It's just an adaptive armor hardener. With this active, you're going to be getting an increase to all of your resistances on your armor of 26.33%. And obviously, if you go up to a higher meta level, you'll get more of these. Now, by having three of these active, there is a stacking penalty, but three of them is still the best way to go here. With the fourth one here, the fourth slot, is an Imperial Navy reactive armor hardener. Now what a reactive armor hardener does compared to an adaptive armor hardener is this responds to the damage that you're taking. If you are taking explosive damage, then the explosive resistances increase, but the electromagnetic, thermal, and kinetic will drop accordingly. This means if you're being shot at by, say, an enemy ship that's using lasers, which are doing, therefore, electromagnetic and thermal damage, then both of those resistances will increase, but the explosive and the uh, explosive and the kinetic will decrease accordingly and again vice versa depending on the type of damage that you're taking. Um, this means that normally in a standard setup you want two adaptive hardeners before you go to a reactive. The third slot should always be a reactive. For your fourth slot there's really not much between it between another reactive or another adaptive. I personally go for the adaptive um, especially on armor ones simply because if you're using armor tanking most of the time you're going to have pretty high resistances to kinetic, thermal, and uh, electromagnetic, but you're going to have weaker resistances to explosive. Now, explosive is being done by mainly Minmatar um, and mainly uh, Kaldari missiles as well. So Minmatar cannons, Kaldari missiles, and the Minmatar missiles as well for what it's worth. Um, but those have a damage spread of three, if not four. Um, missiles, of course, apply all four damage types. Cannons apply explosive. Um, kinetic and a little bit of thermal as well. Therefore, having three or four damage types means the reactive doesn't really adjust all that much and the adaptive does pull ahead. So I tend to go two slots would be both adaptives. A third slot means you're going to put in a reactive. A fourth slot means another adaptive. You could also put in something like a, a damage control unit here, which will give you a passive 8% or so um, increase to all your resistances and you can activate it for a 15, uh, 13 second duration. Again, I tend to personally prefer the 3-1 three, uh, three setup, but again, you could go 2-1 and then the DCU if you're going for PvP, that's a very good way of doing it, it just gives you that burst of survivability. Now, because I'm intending this for small fleet use, I have a medium armor repper here as well. Again, this can be upsized to a large armor repper if you have enough power grid for it. This is just to repair the damage that we are taking, because obviously we're going to be taking damage on other people's uh, behalf. We're going to want to be able to repair this up ourselves to a certain degree. If you are in a fleet that has an armor logistics vessel, something like an Execra, um, then absolutely you may decide that rather than going for the armor repairer here, you might decide for a damage control unit or yet another adaptive armor hardener, all kinds of things you can go for here depending on your setup in the fleet. I like to have at least one armor rep myself just in case the logistics is busy doing other things and it helps take a bit of the stress off. Um, but if you are running with competent logistics, um, you might decide that you swap out that particular slot there. Now for the rigs, I thought this time around I would showcase something interesting using the integrated rigs. A standard setup here, however, we'll talk about in just a moment. Looking at the integrated rigs, you'll see I've gone for three sets of integrated rigs, all of them using Universal 3P Combat Integrated Modules. 
all of them using anti-kinetic pump 3, trimark armor pump 3, and anti-explosive pump 3. That is basically plugging our armor's weaknesses. Armor is weakest to explosive, it has the lowest resistances to explosive damage, and kinetic being the second uh, largest hole there. So we plug those using the rigs, and the third slot here I go for a Trimark Armor Pump just to increase the actual straight up HP that we have in armor. Now, if you just want to keep this fairly cheap, then just go for one of each of those rigs. One anti-kinetic pump three, one anti-explosive pump three, one Trimark Armor Pump three. Those are your three rig, rig slots, that's done there. If you fancy blinging this out though, using the Universal 3P Combat Integrated module does give you a net increase across the board um, having all of these fit. And it's a fairly sizable increase. Um, for a Mala 2 Guardian or for something like the Harbinger Guardian, the, the sort of top tier variants, I do recommend this. Bling it all the way up, make it as absolutely insanely powerful as you can. If you're just going for something like a Coercer, a Catalyst or the standard Malathorax Guardian, you may not want to spend quite as much on it. Now, the same is then true for the engineering side. I've gone for a polycarbon engine housing and auxiliary thrusters. This is just to give us that little bit of momentum to get back and forth to where we're needed, if just helps us keep pace with the fleet, for example. Um, and then for the third run here, I've gone for an enhanced 2P engineering integrated module running a capacitor control circuit 3 and a semiconductor memory cell 3. Again, you could just go for a semiconductor memory cell 3, a capacitor control circuit, and then one of the momentum rigs, um, but it's kind of up to you. Again, doing it this way I found was good enough to give us full capacitor stability and it's over 50% stability, which is always something I like to aim at here. You can see that's nice, decent capacitor stability, um, which means we can actually take a little bit of neutralizing or Nosferatu on us um, before we start to lose that capacitor. It means again we don't need to rely on our logistics boosting our capacitor remotely all that much. Try and be as self-sufficient as possible, that just helps ease the uh, logistics side of things a little bit more. That does bring me to one final point that we can talk about here in regards to the Malatu Guardian's low slots. Again, if you wanted to, if you do have competent logistics, you may even decide, especially if you're going to be tanking dead spaces, that you might want to drop, say, the Repper for a battery. That battery can fill up that slot just to make sure that your adaptive armor hardeners and your reactive armor hardener keep going as long as possible whilst you have the uh, capacitor drain of being in a Nihilus dead space. Just a thought, again, it does depend on your fleet makeup. To give a brief demonstration on how those low slots actually affect our armor resistances, let's have a look here. So you can see that cold, without any of these active, we're looking at 38,060 EHP, and across our armor that's 11,602. Our resistances vary between 48% and 73%. Now, if we close this down and we go through and activate all of our armor hardeners, I am going to reactivate the reactive despite the fact it's not going to do anything since we're not taking damage. If we now come back through, you'll see that our EHP has shot all the way up to 69,486 and our resistances now vary between 78% and 87%. That is a significant increase and does reduce the amount of damage that we're taking here quite dramatically. This does mean that, again, you could decide you want the DCU, or it's entirely up to you. Again, I cannot stress this enough, how you choose to fit your Guardian is going to vary wildly based on the type of content that you're intending to, ch uh, to, to challenge, and on your fleet composition around you. Bear that in mind when it comes to fitting your ship. And there we have it. That is everything that I think you're going to need to know about Armor Link modules and Armor Guardians to get started with them. It should be enough information for you to understand how Armor Link modules work and how Armor Guardians should operate. Give you an idea of how to fit them, how to use them, and how to support your fleet by helping to mitigate damage that they would take. The use of a Guardian is absolutely astronomical. The ability to go into something like a Nihilus Dead Space 10 can vary wildly based on whether or not you have competent guardians in the fleet. A fleet without guardians can do a lot less than a fleet with a single guardian. This means that if you are trained into flying these ships, you are almost guaranteed to be accepted into any fleet you could want to join. Guardians and logistics, they are always in high demand, so if you can trade into both of them, you're always going to find a slot in a, uh, in a fleet. Of course, that does mean I need to do an Armor Guardian video at some point in the future soon as well, so do stay tuned for that one. 
Anyway, folks, let me know your thoughts and opinions regarding Armor Link modules and indeed the various different Armor Guardian ships. Do you fly one? If so, what's your fit? What's the situation of using that fit? What do you like to do with it? Let me know in the comment section down below. Otherwise, thank you for watching me right the way to the end. Happy sailing, and see you in New Eden!